Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management at Zions Bank Corporation. Thank you very much for joining us for our 2024 Economic and Financial Market Outlook. Today, we'll cover our thoughts for the economy, stock, and bond markets as we head into 2024. Uh, with me is Rebecca Robinson, Head of Wealth Management. She'll come on and we'll cover questions at the end of the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's go ahead and review first 2023, and we'll specifically start on the fourth quarter of 2023. Broad brace strength during the fourth quarter of 2023. Most asset classes had a strong quarter and helped 2023 finish on a positive note. Financial markets abruptly reversed course in the end of the third quarter, uh, which was a tough quarter. Uh, we turned on a dime and a very strong finish. As you can see here, most asset classes firmly positive, led by real estate over the fourth quarter. But again, most of the equity asset classes, fixed income asset classes, all positive. And when you look at 2023 as a whole, again, a tough third quarter. And many investors were questioning uh, the results year to date. But as we look at the year as a whole, it really was a good one for investors based on that bounce back. Even bonds after a tough three-year bond after three-year run bounced back strongly in the, in the fourth quarter to finish the year positive. It was one of the strongest two months run for the bond market on record. So a historically strong finish to the year for bonds. This was a year of concentrated performance. As you look on the far left there, US large caps, that is the S&P 500, up 26%. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment, but again, a, a reminder that when you take a longer term view, 2022 was or 2022 was a very difficult year for investors, and if you stuck with your investment plan, you were very much rewarded in 2023. So you can see the breadth of positive returns in 2023. Let's talk a little bit about that concentration I mentioned. Large cap tech drove the early gains. When you look at the S&P 500, seven stocks uh, made up for most of that return. The Magnificent Seven, a term I'm sure you've heard of, uh, they comprised the bulk of performance up 76% uh, on average. When you look at the index, 26.3% uh, for the S&P 500 and the rest of the market up 17 and a half percent. That's still a very good return, but for investors comparing to the broad index, this is an important point to understand on why not all investments may have performed the same over 2023. On a positive note, that gap did narrow over the fourth quarter. Uh, we don't recommend a concentrated approach, and we'll get more into detail on that later as to why. So a concentrated performance, uh, yet 2023 provided yet another reminder not to time the market. Here we look at the S&P 500 specifically for 2023. The blue line is the total return index over the course of 2023. And then we look at if you miss the best five days, the best 10 days, et cetera, over the course of 2023, you can see performance is greatly impacted, just missing a few of the best days. So yet a reminder that in 2023, given the challenges throughout the year, given a narrow market, and most stocks were down through the end of September, it's a reminder to stay invested, not try to jump in and out of the market because you would have missed out on a very strong fourth quarter. Speaking of timing and bouncing back, the a balanced portfolio bounced back strongly. The 60-40 stock bond portfolio, which gets a lot of media attention in 2022, lots of talk that the 60-40 was dead, even through the early part of 2023, but that is certainly not the case. So after a dismal 2022, that balanced portfolio came roaring back. Once again, a reminder to stay invested, stick with your investment program over the longer term. So balanced portfolios bounce back in a big way. Let's uh, move to the economy now. And one of the main stories for 2023 was the decline in inflation, CPI inflation, after reaching a peak of 9.1% in June 2022, came all the way down to 3.4% in December of last year. Pretty sharp deceleration. The big risk for 2021 and 22 has come out of the market. Uh, and again, the this will be sort of a, a there, there will be a tailwind to additional uh, declines in inflation as we go forward. Here we show overall CPI, which is the blue line, 
and then core CPI excluding shelter. Shelter's in gray, and that was a stubborn part of CPI and why it took longer to come down. Those reflect rents. Those rents are now coming down or negative on a year-over-year -year basis, and that has a lagged component to the CPI. So we'll continue to see deceleration in the shelter CPI, which should be a tailwind for inflation and lead to inflation coming down. In fact, the rate of change over the past six months on CPI is getting close to the Fed's 2% target. This is important because it will provide cover for the Fed to ultimately lower rates in 2024. Uh, so we'll have other risks in 2024, but inflation slowly fading into the background. We should see continued declines, even if more modest, on inflation. Let's move to our two of our favorite indicators on the economy, the ISM manufacturing PSI and PMI and the ISM services PMI. Manufacturing had been below 50 since late 2022. When you're below 50 or when the index is below 50, that indicates contraction. Manufacturing in contraction for all of 2023 and not really showing much of a rebound ever so slightly lately. The most recent report, however, on the services component of the PMI fell to near 50. So we're seeing a slowdown on the services side after being firmly in expansion territory uh, for 2023. And it still is an expansion territory, but that slowdown to near 50 raises questions of a broader economic slowdown as we come into 2024. In fact, the employment component of that report fell to 43, which is in traction territory. It's just one report, but it is a sign to us that GDP growth for the coming year, which is on track, or for 2023, which is on track for two to two and a half percent growth, is likely to slow into the one and a half, two percent range as we look into 2024. Moving to labor markets, it's a solid year for job growth, almost 2.7 million jobs created in 2023, a good year for job growth. You can see well above the historical long term average. So the labor market remains very much firm. There are no signs of a recession here, and labor has been resilient. Uh, again, no weakness from the labor market. At the most, you see a labor market, however, that is coming more into balance. And one way we measure that is by looking at the ratio of job openings to unemployed individuals looking for work. And that ratio has slowly come down, meaning that this is no longer a hot labor market, uh, but one that in fact coming more into balance. And you'll see that this metric, this ratio is getting close to its pre-COVID level. Now, this isn't a sign of weakness on an absolute basis, just an indication that the labor market is becoming more balanced. And again, it also gives the Fed cover to eventually lower interest rates. Uh, so no sign of notable labor market deterioration. That would be one of the hallmarks of a recession. So a recession unlikely to be on the horizon. We don't see that. Uh, there is still a risk. We'll talk more about that. Weekly jobless claims, one of the best leading indicators of the labor market, still very low on a historical basis and no, not showing any signs of danger. The consumer has been a stalwart for the economy. Consumer spending has been steady throughout 2023 and looks to be so going forward. This is trend consumer spending, real disposable income, uh, that trend as consumer spending has gone back above that trend in late 2023. You can see the surge during COVID. Uh, the consumer remains in very good shape thanks to prior uh, wage gains, a st steady labor market, and they'll continue to do their part to support the economy. No signs of stress as of yet from the consumer. And one of the key concepts that we focused on with regards to the consumer is the, this concept of excess savings. And there's different ways to measure it. This chart shows one from the New York Federal Reserve showing how consumers will have sa generally save with the blue line. But since 2022, consumers have started not to save and draw down those savings, part of that due to the gray section of this chart, which is inflation-adjusted excess savings. And this is money that consumers had either from not being able to spend it during the pandemic and then in combination with the tremendous stimulus uh, delivered over just after the pandemic. So you see that those excess savings are still significant. At some point, as you see, it's coming down. That could have a negative impact on consumer spending. The San Francisco Fed has their own version of this metric, uh, which shows that consumers have $430 billion of excess savings still 
at the end of 2023. A hard one to measure down exactly. Sometime in 2024, if this continues to dwindle, it could have a negative impact on spending. But for the time being, consumer continue to be in good shape and should support continued economic growth. If there is some cracks to be seen in the consumer, it is the fact that the Fed's interest rate hack campaign is having an impact. Uh, it would be naive to dismiss that it isn't. Here are delinquency rates on auto loans, delinquency rates over 90 days, U.S. delinquency rates on all credit cards. They're still low overall, but you can see the trend higher that continued from 2022 into 2023, something that bears watching as a potential risk. Now let's move to the equity market. And as we finish 2023 and start 2024, we begin the year with expensive valuations. And we've seen some modest stock market volatility to start 2024. Uh, you, the, this shows the forward PE ratio for the S&P 500 market cap weighted index, which is the gold line. And the blue line is the equal weighted index, which is a better representation for the market as a whole. You can see both of these metrics are above their long-term averages, particularly so for the market cap weighted index, which is influenced by the uh, valuations of the Magnificent Seven, Microsoft, Google, Tesla, uh, Amazon, and the other large caps off Google as well, that continue to trade very expensively and justifiably so as their profits are stronger. But at some point you have to question whether the extra valuation is worth uh, that expensive uh, or where to pay that valuation for that limited group of equity. So a bit of caution uh, not to expect such a strong year going forward. We're a little more modest. When you pay those higher valuations, you have to look at profit growth, at earnings. And those estimates, in our view, are still too high. The blue line represents implied uh, earnings growth for 2024. And right now, those estimates are coming down. But still, the average consensus estimate shows an implied growth rate of 11% and an additional 11% in 2025. We think earnings are more likely to grow in the five to 8% range uh, on, in 2024. And if stocks simply track those that profit growth, valuations don't change. I think that that is the basis for our equity expectation of return in 2024, mid to high single digits. Uh, but you do have to take into account slowing uh, profit growth that is not likely to meet expectations along with above average valuation. So we'll keep an eye on those earnings estimates throughout 2024. That could be a key driver right now. Again, those earnings expectations are too high. And if there is a silver lining, it's that most of Wall Street does already expect those expectations to come down. So it would take a real shock or decline in earnings to be that a, a true and significant headwind for the equity market. I mentioned concentration earlier. Let's get back to that context. This is the performance of the S&P 500 market cap weighted index versus the equal weighted index. Now, the market cap weighted index has a 28% weighting to the top five stocks. If you go to the top seven, it's in the low 30s. It's one of the more concentrated markets we've had in a long time. And as I showed earlier, uh, the Magnificent Seven dominated return for the market cap weighted index versus the equal weighted index. And that gap was the largest on record or largest since 1998. So it's been many, many years since we've had such a concentrated performance from the market cap weighted or such a difference from the market cap weighted return versus the equal weight. Usually it's much closer. We took a look at what happens historically when that's the case. And here we look at the weight of the top 100 stocks in the S&P 500. Anytime that weight has exceeded 68%, in other words, when 100 stocks have exceeded 68% of the S&P 500, uh, that has resulted in a top one of the tw top 20% of observations. So we looked at the top quintile observations. So anytime that blue line is above the gold line, meaning it is rare to have the top 100 stocks be that dominant a percentage of the index. And what did that mean for go forward returns versus the equal weight? Well, we show that below in the table. And you can see that the S&P 500 equal weight has outperformed the S&P 500 market cap weighted index over three, six, 12, and 24 month periods. So do be aware of that concentration in the S&P 500. History tells us that that performance will not persist and you're better off being diversified and in, in a diverse equity portfolio 
on a go forward basis. This counters the argument for many that say, I just want a single S&P 500 ETF. Yes, that worked great in the rear view mirror, but we would caution against that approach on a go forward basis. So history shows us that concentration again is a risk and you're better off with more diversification. Looking closer within the equity markets, value versus growth. Uh, this measures whether value is more expensive to growth or vice versa. Value stocks, your dividend payers currently are more attractive relative to growth, such as technology and the, and, and the like. Uh, it was a different story in 2022 with value outperforming, but that reversed again in 2023. When we look at value sectors of the market, we see better uh, valuations there. And we have a slight bias in our portfolios to value stocks on a go forward basis due to their more attractive valuations. International equities also more attractive relative to the U.S. counterparts. And keep in mind, developed international equity actually had a very strong year, no exposure to the Magnificent Seven directly, and yet up almost 20% for the year. A great return for international despite the negative headlines. And that's what more attractive valuations can do on a go forward basis. We philosophically still have a dominant share in U.S. stocks, but it's hard to ignore the more attractive valuations on international equities still should comprise a component of your portfolios uh, and a key part of the allocation. You can see the valuations relative to history among the most attractive for international equities. Let's turn to fixed income markets and just a bit of history. We used this table in our last webinar showing that bonds do rally following the last rate hike. And it's very, very likely that the July, late July Fed rate hike was the last one in the cycle. Uh, you can see historically, after the last rate hike, bond market performance, as measured by the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index, has been rather strong. Uh, and in July, if we use July 20, 2023, just for five months, the bond market's up over 2% through the end of December. So the bond market is tracking to this historical trend. Uh, we think the worst is behind bond investors. And while we think the bond market rally that happened in November and December might have been too far too fast, we really think the risk for bonds is in the rearview mirror. Continue to have an allocation and do expect better performance from bonds going forward. So, so far, this trend keeping uh, intact and, again, looking to see better performance from bonds. As we look at the Fed perhaps done with their rate hike, it's worth a look at history and to show what the 10-year Treasury yield has done at the conclusion of prior rate hike campaigns. Uh, here we show prior rate hike campaigns when they ended and then trading days around that last rate hike. The black line is the average of all of those rate hike periods shown here going back to 1980. And the gold line is the current episode, uh, which shows 2023. And although yields did increase after the last rate hike, which was a little bit of an anomaly compared to history, but the 10-year Treasury yield did come back down. And I think of note on this chart, when you get to one year after the end of the Fed's rate hike campaign, in all but one instance, the 10-year Treasury yield was lower. So we do have history on our side to suggest that the peak in bond yields is likely behind us and that the backdrop for bonds is much improved in 2023, or 24 rather. And another way to look at that is simply plot the yield, uh, the 10-year Treasury yield, and what does it mean for the broad bond market as measured by the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index. And you can see here that yield, which is the blue line, is a good predictor of future return. Again, like, we used this last quarter, and I think it's worth reiterating. As the 10-year Treasury yield went up to 5 and now hovering near right around 4%, it means that performance is going to move up from a trailing 10-year average return of about 1% up towards 4%. That is a significant improvement. We do think bonds are back and continue to play a key role in portfolios. So you do expect much better performance uh, from bonds on a go forward basis. Within the bond market, not finding a lot of value in some of the corporate sectors, and uh, not that we expect them to uh, dramatically underperform, but just the timing for an investment in high yield bonds or investment grade corporates, not ideal. Both of these sectors are expensive relative to history. We're showing the average high yield bond spread or the yield advantage to comparable treasuries uh, under 4% for high yield bonds and for investment grade corporates under 1%. So not getting as much of a yield advantage as you would historically. These can stay low, but with uh, default rates starting to come up and what we think might be a little bit of pressure on corporate and credit going forward. 
we think you're better off having a diverse approach, use your use have treasuries in there and not overweight more economically sensitive sectors like high yield bonds. So we're staying high quality in our bond allocation. And in the municipal market, for those that are invested in municipals, please stay the course. But for new investors, the market has gotten expensive. This is the average AAA municipal yield as a percentage of treasury. The lower that ratio, the more expensive municipal bonds are to treasuries and vice versa. And over the last couple months of 2023, and then particularly to start 2024, municipals have gotten expensive relative to treasuries. If you're a top tax bracket investor, again, stay invested. Uh, but this, uh, for new money, uh, we take a more cautious approach. We do see issuance increasing, and March has historically been a difficult month for munis. So we take a more of a um, cautious or uh, slow approach to investing in munis here over the next couple months. Just a note on how muni valuations have gotten expensive here over the last couple months. All right, we wrap up bonds and let's move to some policy. Uh, first and foremost, we this is an election year and a reminder that our mantra is profits over politics. A lot of investors who decide their investments based on their political affiliation, and I'm not making political affiliation, affiliation here, stock market does not care about your political party of choice. Uh, you can see the returns of the S&P 500 here under a variety of political regimes. They are remarkably consistent. Uh, only in the Democratic Congress, Republican president, which was uh, we've only had a few instances of that, are returns much weaker than average. Again, would not let politics drive your investment decision making. Uh, it has, again, never really been a driver. It's more about the pace of economic growth profit growth, level of interest rates that will ultimately drive your investment success. And then one other policy item that we'd like that we think bears watching is the budget deficit is growing again after improving post COVID. We have seen the budget deficit grow now negative six and a half percent. Congress is actually looking at tax, tax cuts and additional stimulus as we speak. It's hard to believe if that was the case. We'd still we will have a larger budget deficit. And what does that mean? It means that we are likely to have less fiscal stimulus uh, if we, after the election. In other words, government will be less able to provide stimulus, in our view, to the economy, particularly with interest rate costs still on the rise. So this will bear watching. It could mean less help from the government um, and potentially a risk to bond investors, as we do need to make sure we remain on a, a sustainable fiscal path. All right, that concludes my prepared remarks. Let's uh, move to Q and A. All right, Anthony, thank you very much. Um, as always, very insightful, uh, wonderful, kind of hear where we think things are going. We're going to move on. We'll start with what I would say some maybe more macroeconomic types of questions, um, and we touched a little bit on treasury rates. But there are a lot of questions about where do we think rates are going in 2024? Specifically, do we think the Fed will lower rates? And then, as I think we always like to do, my next question is, why does it why does it matter? Does that in fact uh, affect how you invest? Are you trying to get a mortgage? So let's talk a little bit about rates. Yeah, so in terms of interest rates, uh, our view is that interest rates are either flat to slightly lower, so unchanged to slightly lower in 2024 don't see a big move. Uh, part of that, and I think that's a cautious view, there's a lot of expectation rates coming lower. Bond market did a lot in the last two months of 2023. It was a big move, historically strong move to see that big a decline in interest rates over such a short period of time. And specifically, I'm talking about the 10-year treasury, which had exceeded five and then dropped to about 370 uh, in just over two months. Uh, the Fed has said they are going to cut rates three times in 2024. Uh, the average Wall Street analyst, I believe, is looking for four rate cuts from the Fed. A lot of that's factored into the 10-year Treasury yield, so that's why I don't see a big move. The futures market, on the other hand, uh, and this is what's impacting market pricing now, is expecting six interest rate cuts, or almost six, which I think is too aggressive. And therefore, as we've seen here so far in January, the market's starting to walk some of that back, thinking it is too much that the Fed won't follow through with that aggressive an approach. So as a, as a bond investor, expect flight rates to be flat to slightly lower. Um, why does that matter? I would I would note two things. The rates are higher now. You do get more compensation in terms of yield. That provides better downside protection. That was not the case just a couple of years ago. Uh, 
and therefore your risk reward is certainly better in bonds. But we'd like to take a long term view when you are getting paid with these higher yields. Do be invested. Don't just sit on the sidelines because if the Fed does cut rates, uh, those cash rates are going to go uh, way down. So we do uh, we're positioned neutral. We don't think bonds are overly attractive where we want to incorporate those longer term maturities. But we did have a defensive positioning uh, through much for the past couple of years and took that off in, in the middle part of 2023. So broadly staying neutral, again, not enough value to go into long term debt. But we also don't stay too short term. You could miss out on some of those higher yields. Well, and I think that leads really into the next question that's sitting on the sidelines. So we've had cash rates you know, hovering around five, a little higher, a little lower. And this question is, how long will that last? But then when should I switch from cash to bonds? Um, and I know you talked a little bit about the aggregate bond market return, cash versus an investment strategy. But as we think about cash in the broader context of an investment philosophy, how do we think about that? And how are we thinking about those rates? Well, we, do, we, we don't think you should be overly invested in cash. If you have a short-term need, yes, by all means, uh, the 5% cash looked really attractive for much of 2023, but now that we look back on the full year, you would have been better off being invested uh, either in bonds or in a diversified portfolio. Depending on the timing, that wouldn't have been always the case, but for by and large, yes, you would have been better off being invested. Now, cash serves a purpose. If you are in cash now, I would suggest putting that to work. When the Fed cuts rates, you'll start to see those rates come down, and certainly parts of the bond market have already anticipated those lower rates. So don't wait too long because then if the Fed does follow through with rate cuts and you stay in cash, then you're stuck because other market rates might move even lower. Uh, so important to put that that money to use. Yeah, and I think we always like to say cash is a liquidity strategy and investments are a long-term strategy. So I think it is important to know what the buckets are for and then think about them in the right time frames as well. Um, Big picture question here, what are the biggest threats to the economy and markets in 2024? And any thoughts on how to prepare for them? You know, the, the, there are a number of threats I, I touched on on a couple. One was the delinquency rates. Uh, the, the, the Fed's had a very aggressive Fed rate hike campaign. Their medicine works with a lag. We're only starting. We still haven't felt the full effects of that rate hike campaign. So the impact to the consumer uh, they're holding up well, but there could be impacts later this year. It could be impacts to credit quality. Uh, we have to keep an eye out on those. There are geopolitical risks. I tend to think those are more short-term in nature. Historically, geopolitics haven't been a long-term influencer. They create short bouts of market volatility. Uh, and again, wouldn't uh, those are the some of the risks. I, I will say, and I, I get this question a, a lot, the, the biggest risks are the ones you can't foresee. Uh, those are the ones that really blindside you, create the biggest risks. So What's the best way to protect for that? It's being diversified. You might not hit a home run, but it'll give you that better protection in an adverse market. We saw last year. That's really how you want to be positioned to protect uh, from those risks. Uh, you know, we saw some volatility around Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, it paid to be diversified. You never know when these things will come out. So it's, again, best to be diversified. Yeah, and Anthony, I think if we look over time, there are short-term shocks that happen from things, but they tend to, over time, work their way out. Um, I think we've seen a pandemic, we've seen a banking liquidity crisis, and really, none of those were things I think you would foresee, and you really can't invest around them. Um, let's jump to the recession piece. You talked about labor is strong, but it is coming into balance. Um, we see it as unlikely, but still a risk. But, you know, I think this is now our kind of third year running where the Great Recession is coming. Um, and I think sometimes this harkens back even to 2008 and kind of what we experienced then. Comments on a recession in 2024 um, and, and how we should be thinking about that. Yeah, for a recession, I think the, the risks are low. I mean, you look at the data, we don't really see one on the horizon, but there are a number of metrics that historically have singled a recession. So I, I you don't want to ignore those. Uh, the Fed's interest rate hikes work with a lag and there could be a negative impact. And it might be late 2024, it could even be 2025. Uh, you know, I still think we have probably another year before to fully feel those those impacts. So it is a risk. Uh, and again, being diversified helps helps manage that. But for now, uh, yet yeah, not something we see from the data. Uh, and even today, some retail sales data is still reflecting well on the consumer industrial production better than expected. So you're not seeing that immediate uh, recession risk by any means. Yeah, 
You know, a, another question has come in and it, it goes along these same lines. Like, please comment on a potential government shutdown and what that impact might be on the economy. Again, another theme that I think we've heard for many, many years. Yeah, we will. Uh, we do have a government potential government shutdown looming, unfortunately. Um, I do think we get this one resolved. When we look at government shutdowns in the past, uh, it's created short term market volatility. Stocks sell off in advance of that. But we're talking about a few days here. We've never had a shutdown last more than I, I think it was less than a month, maybe not even that. And I, I think that when you the markets tend to anticipate the improvement, really, really hard to invest around. It will be a short term volatility maker, but I would not drive your investment approach based on that. All right. And now we kind of talked about even the beginning of last year was tough. And then the markets finished very, very strong. Um, when we think about our feelings on long term investments in the stock market, the bond market, there's also that balance that a very small number of equities drove a lot of that. So I think the first question is, philosophically, how do how are we feeling about long term investing? And I think there's probably a couple of follow ons from there. Yeah, I, uh, we are obviously believers in it. And and I really like to point here, it's it's really a planning. It's about financial planning, planning for your future, deciding what is the goal of your investment money? When do you need it? What is the objective? And once you make that clear and align your investments with that goal, that is the key. And that's ultimately what you have to stick to uh, because we have over 100 years of data that is remarkably consistent. Sometimes returns are better, sometimes are lower. But when you're looking at five, 10, or mostly 10 year plus horizons, the math works out and diversification and growth uh, does pay benefits and you grow your capital over time. So we still are firm believers in it, despite all of the ups and downs of 2023, 2022, the pandemic, uh, investors are better off having been having invested. And uh, we think that continues to be the case. So we still are full advocates of uh, a long term view. Perfect. And when we talk about the Magnificent Seven, the concentration, things like that, you know, one question that's come in is, can you elaborate against buying like an S&P 500 ETF from a diversification standpoint? Um, person saying, wouldn't that actually represent a diversified portfolio? So I think this is the equal weight index versus market weight and maybe explaining to people a little bit more about when we say where the performance came from, but also the danger of, because another thought is, do I just double down on these seven stocks? Do I do I go toward a sector? Maybe it's a tech sector. How do we think about that in context of your portfolio? You know, I think, uh, you know, you look back to 2022 and it's a good example. Microsoft lost half its value uh, that year. Some of these stocks have been extremely volatile. Can you stomach that type of volatility? Uh, when you have Apple, that's over 7% of the index. Uh, that you know, that's if they miss an earnings or have some sort of uh, or announce some sort of profit warning, uh, something then that has an outsized impact on your portfolio. Uh, the data we had on that concentration shows that when you have a few number of stocks representing you know almost thirty percent of the index, uh, you're putting your 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 kind of your investment success in a limited view. And that could continue. I, I'm not going to dispute that. But history shows that you're better off being diversified. And when you have these big concentrations to take some of that away, I also think when the Fed is uh, removing their stimulus, there's historical precedent for diversification working better. Uh, and I think that that's also a reminder. So you do have risk. It, it may not seem like it, but when you're investing in a small number of companies that are driving your success, all it takes is a couple of bad earnings to really whipsaw the market the other way. And what we have seen is when there has been a sell-off, uh, Apple during the summer as well was down more than the market. You just have to be willing to either know that that is some of the risk and you have to ride out those ups and downs. Again, we favor that over the long term, you're better off being diversified. And speaking of diversification, let's move over to bonds. Because bonds are another one. I think there's some shell uh, shocks still out in the marketplace. That was always where people at least saw some volatility, but not as much as we experienced. And we know a couple of years ago, there was nowhere to hide. But now we've talked about even after a very hard three-year run, we've now seen the strongest two months on record. While well, you're still also putting it with caution. But how do we think about bonds, investments in a portfolio. And I even think sometimes we're seeing people trade those off with cash. Um, yeah, I won't have bonds, I'll just have cash instead. What are we thinking about those, maybe short and longer term? 
So, so we're we're fairly to you know have have a variety of maturity short intermediate some long but mostly intermediate is where we think you should be positioned uh, the fact that 10 years right out of just over four percent today was under one just a few years ago that that's a significant improvement in income that income is a buffer to downside meaning you can withstand some price depreciation and the income will mean that you have a positive return when you look out over a 12-month horizon now if you're Horizon is six months, nine months, by all means, do not invest in bonds, stay in cash. But for someone looking at the longer term, definitely have that intermediate view because not only do you benefit from higher yields, but you can reinvest that interest. That compounding of interest is a key driver of, of return. And what I've seen in my career is that when rates are cut and investors stay short, stay short, waiting for higher rates, they end up waiting a longer term, a, long, a longer amount of time for rates to come back up. And then it's slow to happen and you would have simply been better off being invested uh, along the way. I know it sounds attractive on that five, those 5% 5 yields, but they won't be here to stay. So it makes sense to diversify. Take advantage of those higher rates, which uh, as I showed on the on the webinar, the projected performance of the long term is going to improve a lot now. Perfect. And we have one that's a, a bit of a technical question, but I think this helps people put it in perspective. The question is, how do investment returns relate to inf inflation? So in other words, if we say an 8% return on equities, wouldn't that just be offset by an 8% inflation rate? And do we see those things together traditionally? We we do look at in, inflation adjusted returns and historically stocks have been your best bet against inflation. In other words, your highest after inflation returns are with equities. Uh, it's not with commodities. People think that that's not the case. Uh, of some of your weaker returns after inflation. Uh, bonds do beat inflation historically, but less so. So if you do want to beat inflation, you need to have an allocation to stocks and a healthy allocation to stocks. There's just no way around that. Historically, they've done the best at beating uh, inflation. So we do look at that. It is important. And therefore, investors looking to beat inflation need to have a, a healthy allocation to equities. Fantastic. Well, that's the end of our questions. And I, I think if you've joined this webinar, uh, one, we want to thank you, but also everyone here uh, at the Band Corporation is here to help you with your questions as well. So if you have questions, you can reach out to your banker, we uh, reach out to your wealth advisor, and we are always happy to answer those. And with that, thank you for joining and we'll see you in a few months.